a new planetary system found with seven Earth and super Earth sized planets, the remains of another planet inside the Earth. And it's time to replace your wallpaper again with this new image of the Crab Nebula from JWST. All this and more in this week's Space Bites. This story just broke hours before we started recording today, and I'm really excited about it. Astronomers have reported finding seven planets around a sun like star. Now this discovery comes from the Kepler Space Telescope, which was one of the flagship planet hunting missions that NASA launched several years ago. And as you probably recall, you know, it was designed to find an Earth sized world orbiting around a sun like star in the habitable zone, it is what would have found that other Earth. And unfortunately, the reaction wheels failed on the space telescope. And so astronomers had to change the mission, it could no longer stare at these sun like stars, but it could look for planets around red dwarf stars, and it found plenty of them. Like, at this point, Kepler has found 1000s of planets, 1000s more candidate planets, and astronomers are still crunching through the data to catch up on everything that Kepler observed. And so we keep getting these announcements of planets coming out of Kepler. And this one is crazy. First, the good news. And this is a star that is a little bit bigger than the sun, a little hotter than the sun, and they found seven planets orbiting around it. Two of them are kind of Earth sized worlds, maybe a little bit bigger, and five of them are super Earth. So they kind of range in size from like 1.4 times the radius of Earth to about 1.8 times the radius of Earth. So think about the Trappist one system, that's the same number of planets. And the big difference is that because these are around a sun like star, you're not going to get those mega flares that we have with Trappist one. And so Astronomers are hoping that these planets are still going to have their atmospheres. Maybe the first two planets will be more like super Mercury's, but the outer planets could very well have thick atmospheres. And so right now, the observations are just the size of these planets. They are the size of super Earth's, but they actually might be smaller because they've got a thick atmosphere. And then we won't know until radio velocity technique can confirm the mass of the planets. And from there, they'll be able to figure out how much of it is planet, how much of it is atmosphere, but a really exciting discovery. Here's the bad news. They are hot, too hot. They're all located within the beginning of the habitable zone around this star. So imagine Mercury's and Venus's from the beginning to the end and nothing farther out in the habitable zone. Now it's possible that there could be more planets in this system. I mean, to find seven this close to the stars is, is kind of bonkers and could very well be that over time they'll find other ones. But so far, all that they could find were these seven planets, an ancient planet inside the earth. Speaking of planets, let's talk about the one that you're sitting on right now, except for you astronauts. So the main theory for how the moon formed is that just a few hundred million years after the solar system formed a Mars sized object crashed into the Earth, and the debris turned into the moon and planetary scientists always assumed that Earth and this Mars sized object would kind of mix up and become the structure of the Earth we see today with its core with its mantle and with the crust surrounding it. But back in the 1980s, scientists discovered two blobs of denser material inside the Earth. And they call these large low velocity provinces. And these things are larger than the moon, and they are denser than the surrounding mantle. And so a new study suggests that in fact, these are the remnants of Thea of this Mars sized object that crashed into the Earth. Instead of mixing equally as they thought, it still has enough heavier elements, metals and things like that that were able to hold together against the rest of the mantle that they've resisted mixing up. And so we've got these two blobs of this shattered planet inside the Earth. Did Betelgeuse eat a companion star? Now we've been excited about Betelgeuse for several years now. Will it explode? When's it gonna explode? Will it look like when it explodes? And I have no news to give you on that front. I cannot tell you when Betelgeuse is going to explode sometime between tonight and a million years from now. So there's your estimate. But but there is an interesting study about Betelgeuse and whether or not it might have had a companion star. The majority of large planets, the massive planets are found in multiple star systems, binary star systems, trinary star systems, even up to seven, eight stars all in one system. But Betelgeuse is solitary. But was it always? And so one possibility is that 
a million years ago when Betelgeuse was a normal sized star, it had a companion star orbiting around it. And then Betelgeuse ran out of fuel in its core, it bloated up as a red giant, and it engulfed its companion star. And so its companion star is still orbiting around inside Betelgeuse, or maybe it has since spiraled inward and gone into the core and is lost forever. So astronomers did a simulation of what would happen if a star with 16 times the mass of the sun, you know, a proto Betelgeuse, consumed a star with four times the mass of the sun, this companion star, ending up with roughly the mass that Betelgeuse has today. And one of the interesting outcomes is that this would increase the rotation speed of Betelgeuse. Like right now, the sun rotates at about two kilometers per second, while Betelgeuse rotates at about 5.5 kilometers per second. That's kind of weird. And so one thought is, is that it consumed another star, the star helped spin up its rotation speed. And that's why we see its behavior today. And if it is still alive, then there could be some time in the future, maybe Betelgeuse is going to shrink a little and it may reveal the star again, and then blow it up again and consume it again. Who knows what the future is going to hold for Betelgeuse? Still no prediction on when it's going to explode. The Crab Nebula by James Webb. All right, it's time to update your phone, computer, desktop wallpaper again, this time with the Crab Nebula. Now, I really love when James Webb does these follow on observations of very famous objects. We've seen versions of the Carina Nebula, of the Eagle Nebula, of the Ring Nebula. All of these objects look beautiful thanks to the Hubble Space Telescope, and then they look different and also beautiful thanks to James Webb. And so one classic object that many amateur astronomers have got pictures of, they've seen it through their own telescope, is the Crab Nebula. This is a supernova that went off in the sky, and we saw it in 1054 AD. And there's plenty of historical records of astronomers noting the new star that appeared in the sky and then watching it over the course of several weeks as it faded away. And we know that in fact, this was a massive star that exploded as a supernova about 6500 light years away from us. So it happened. I don't want to do the math. I'm not even going to bother. And the pictures look great in large telescopes in the Hubble Space Telescope, and it looks just phenomenal in James Webb. And what you're getting is this central neutron star that is rotating rapidly. It has a very powerful magnetic field that is surrounding it. And this magnetic field is interacting with the dust and gas that is surrounding the neutron star, the leftover shredded remnants of this dead star. And so with James Webb, you get much finer detail into these regions than we've ever seen before. It's scientifically interesting, but it is just a beautiful picture. So update your wallpaper. Every week we do a vote on our channel where you tell us what you thought was the best story of the week. And last week, the winning vote was the story about three stars vanishing. It was overwhelming. So thank you everybody who voted on this. Of course, we do the vote after we release the video each week, you can find it just as you're scrolling on the phone, or you can find it in the community tab on our channel. Uh, it's most likely to show up on your feed if you're subscribed to our channel. So don't forget to subscribe and then vote and then we will celebrate the winner next week. The Milky Way's black hole is spinning as fast as it can. Now pretty much everything in the universe is spinning from asteroids to planets to stars and including black holes. But like, how do you measure the spin rate of a black hole? When you think about an asteroid, you mark some feature on a surface and then you wait until that feature comes back into view. And then that is the rotation rate of that object. But Black holes are these sort of featureless, smooth objects that are absorbing all of the light, any radiation coming off of it, they're tricky to find. But what black holes do is they tangle up space time around themselves, it's called frame dragging. And the limit to how fast they can rotate is limited by essentially general relativity it defines how fast black holes are able to go. We think about it like it takes infinite amounts of energy to reach the speed of light as a black hole is spinning faster and faster, it takes more material to cause it to spin even faster. And there's a limit. Astronomers can tell how fast this black hole is rotating by the interactions of magnetic fields and its accretion disk around the black hole how that interacts with the environment. And it gives off radiation gives off radio waves gives off x rays. And from that astronomers can tell how tangled up that space time is around the black hole, how much frame dragging is going on. They did the calculations for the supermassive black hole at the heart of the Milky Way. And they found that it is rotating 
almost as fast as is just predicted by the laws of physics. They pretty much can't spin any faster than that. And what's interesting is that it is actually spinning faster than the even larger black hole that's at the heart of M87, even though it is billions of times the mass of the sun has consumed a lot more material, it has a little room left to spin faster than the one at the heart of the Milky Way. Where do rogue planets come from? Now we've been doing a lot of news about rogue planets recently. And like the big story that we covered was the finding of hundreds of rogue planets located in the Orion Nebula. So many you got to wonder where are these things coming from? And there's a few theories like one theory is that they just form in place. If you have a small amount of gas, not a star's worth, and maybe you just get a rogue planet in place. But the other possibility is that they are getting kicked out of star systems. What kind of star systems are likely to kick out rogue planets? If you have just like a single star with a nice planetary system around it, like say the solar system, then you're not going to get these kinds of crazy gravitational interactions between planets that are kicking them out of the system. But when you've got a binary star system where you've got two stars that are at, say, perpendicular angles to each other, and they're moving on eccentric orbits, then there's plenty of chances for mayhem between those two star systems, where the planets are going to get too close to each other, they're going to interact gravitationally, and they're going to kick each other out. So a new paper looked into what are the results of these sort of highly irregular planetary systems as they interact with each other over long periods of time, and they find that they are rogue planet factories. They are able to kick out a lot of their planets early on in their history, and then they're just going to be free floating planets across the Milky Way. And because right now astronomers have only found planets that are like Jupiter mass, maybe down to Saturn mass. But if they're finding those, what they're missing is the vast numbers of the smaller ones, the terrestrial planets, the Mercury sized objects, the Kuiper belt objects, like there is probably a lot of rogue planets out there, many more than we originally knew of. And I think this is starting to dramatically change our understanding of what is the composition of planets in the Milky Way. At this point, people are wondering, could that be an explanation for dark matter? And the answer is no. If you enjoy the work that we do here on our channel, why don't you consider joining our Patreon? It's a way for you to give back to support our writers, researchers, video editors, audio editors, all of the people on this team who are bringing you space science news. We are completely independent and we try to minimize the amount of advertising that we can do across our entire channel. And we can only do that thanks to the help of our patrons. Now, if you do become a patron, I will remove all the ads from the Universe Today website for life. You get access to behind the scenes videos, a patron only question show that we do once a month. It's a lot of additional value, but also you just know that you're supporting space news created for the widest possible audience. So go to patreon.com slash universe today. And this is hot off the press. Just as we were recording this episode, a new picture just came in from NASA's Lucy mission, which is on its way out to visit the Trojan asteroid belt around Jupiter. It did a flyby of one asteroid in the asteroid belt, Dinkanesh, and we just got the new pictures from this flyby. So we got just this photo so far, and it's going to take a few more days to download the rest of the images. So I'm sure next week we'll have a lot more images to show you. But I think the best part of this is the animation of the moon orbiting around the larger asteroid. That is so great. I can't wait to see all of the other objects that Lucy is going to visit course of its mission. So enjoy this sneak preview of what's to come from Lucy, a new map of ice on Mars. When it comes to space exploration, water is going to be one of the most precious resources that we can get our hands on. If you've got water, you've got propellant, you can breathe, you've got a way to drink, you can grow plants, so many uses for water, you just got to get that water. And we know there's water on Mars. I mean, we see it at the polar ice caps at the North and South Pole of Mars. But the question is like, how far does that water extend below the surface? Could we find water closer to the equator? NASA just released a new map of all of the places on Mars that they found subsurface water. And you've got the places where you would expect near the poles, but also into the lower latitudes and also additional spots that are random across the planet. And in these cases, these are places where, say, new craters have been formed on Mars 
and you get this exposed fresh material under the top of the regolith that is filled with ice. And then over a couple of years, that ice sublimates away into the atmosphere of Mars and it's gone. And so some really interesting places on Mars will be found where there's a fresh impact crater, you land quickly and you set that up as your base and you've got water for all of those reasons that we talked about. So if you're planning a trip to Mars, use this map, a collapsed lava chamber on Mars. And speaking of Mars, check out this picture that was just released from the University of Arizona's high rise instrument. This is the really powerful camera that's on board the Mars reconnaissance orbit. This is a collapsed lava chamber on Mars. So think about the history of volcanism on both Earth and Mars, you get these magma chambers that get filled up with lava, and then the lava flows out in various volcanic eruptions, and then the chambers can empty out again, and you're left with this giant chasm under the ground. And then over time, weathering and other eruptions and earthquakes or Mars quakes can crack the roofs of these things and they collapse inward. And we've seen a lot of these collapsed lava tubes across Mars and the moon. But this picture is just so great. It's a big one, you can see the roof of the chamber and then you can see all of the debris down below and how the roof overhangs what's down below. Like we really need to send a helicopter into this thing to find out more, but it's such a great picture. So you can decide, do you want to use the Crab Nebula or this as your desktop wallpaper? Now I'm going to talk about lava tubes some more in a second, but first I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to David Richards, Mark Anstis, Joel Yancey, Antonio Lofilar, Dustin Cable, Vlad Shiblin, Modso, George, David Gilton, Andrew Gross, Jeremy Mattern, Josh Schultz, and Jordan Young, who support us at the Master of the Universe level, and all of our other supporters on Patreon. Now I'm going to talk about lava tubes for a bit here. But before we do, you're going to need to come to grips with my Canadian accent. I'm Canadian, I have an accent, I say lava, pasta, Mazda, llama, like just giggle about it now. All right, are you are you done? All right. Both the moon and Mars are really hostile environments like you do not want to spend a lot of time out on the surface of the moon. Like if you're on the moon, you are experiencing about 200 times more radiation than you would down on the surface of Earth. And if you're on the surface of Mars, it's about 50 times as much radiation than what you get on Earth. These are an increase of cancer and eventually it's a death sentence if you're gonna to spend too much time outside, you want a place that's safe. These lava tubes are incredible because you've got these regions which are underground with a roof. So you're protected from all of that radiation, but also the temperature which can swing into minus 170 degrees to positive 170 degrees above Celsius. It's a very bad temperature swing. But if you get down into one of these lava tubes, then the temperatures remain very constant. Same thing on Mars, you're going 100 degrees below Celsius, 20 degrees above Celsius, but when you're down in the lava tube, the temperatures are exactly the same. And so they are relatively safe places to explore on both the moon and Mars places you could put bases, at the very least we need to explore and then at the same time, they're the most protected environments that you have on Mars. And so if there's any chance of any life or any historical life on Mars, these would be the places that you might be able to find it. And then you've got this geologic history of Mars, because it's written into the sides of the walls down there. And so as we think about space exploration to both the moon and Mars, we think about places that are scientifically interesting, but also places that can protect our explorers, the lava tubes are the best. All right, we'll see you next week.